asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. First met my next guest um, last year, and he made a contribution uh, to the programme. He donated to the programme. And I'd heard his name mentioned a few times, uh, as you would do when you make programmes like this. And I thanked him, and we spoke briefly on the phone and such an interesting guy he is uh, I said look we've got to get you on the programme and it should have happened sooner than this now he's a peacetime veteran of the US Army spent a couple of years as an infantryman based in the US he founded the Central Florida chapter of Veterans for Peace which is a very very big organisation uh, nationwide these days he wanted to get uh, other veterans who fought in and around war to help educate people, to teach generations of people that um, what really goes on in war and why, in fact, wars are really fought and why they are started. Now, he founded the Central Florida chapter and he, he shared with those men and women he met, he shared his opinions about September the 11th, what had gone on before September the 11th, what had gone on on the day and how the false flag of September the 11th had been used to basically lie the US into these wars of aggression in the Middle East. Now, he was surprised that rather than get annoyed and share his anger at this and look into it even more, veterans got mad with him. They didn't want to hear about September the 11th and false flags. And he also found that there was a kind of an identity politics kind of undercurrent to the Veterans for Peace movement, but not just Veterans for Peace, the the anti-war movement in general, and that there was a kind of, if you're a lefty, you're in, and if you're not, you're not wanted. He also found that um, after the Veterans for Peace members passed a resolution to impeach Barack Obama for war crimes in Libya, Actually, the national leadership of the organisation vetoed that uh, decision and did everything it could to neutralise the call from the rank and file to impeach Barack Obama. So he became disillusioned with the peace movement. Is he still disillusioned? Let's welcome to the programme the journalist and activist Phil Restino, who's live in Florida. Phil, welcome to the programme. How are you? Oh, I'm okay, Richie. Thank you very much. I don't know if you can hear me okay. We're hearing you loud and clear. It's almost like you're in the room, Phil. It's absolutely Oh, that's wonderful. That's what it sounds like when I'm tuning into your show, thank God. Well, thanks for that. Do you know, I wish every person who came on the programme invested in a nice bit of kit, a nice bit of hardware. Your microphone is brilliant. Phil, you're sounding uh, loud and clear. Thanks for coming on. How are things in Florida today? Well, here in central Florida, we're getting a little bit of rain, but that's good. We need rain. We, we do get a lot of sunshine here. They call it the sunshine state. And I want to thank you for uh, clarifying that uh, I helped found the central Florida chapter of Veterans for Peace. There, there were five other chap- five chapters all together at, at one time in Florida. And uh, Vets for Peace was a pretty strong organization when uh, the Iraq war was going and, and, and uh, uh, it was a Republican Bush and Cheney in office. And uh, if, if you wouldn't mind, Richie, I'd like to read a quote that got me to join Veterans for Peace. And it was uh, presented by a former president, national president of the organization, uh, Mr. Mike Ferner on, uh, on, on uh, I think it was 16 uh, June 2005, after the uh, Downing Street memo was being uh, uh, investigated. It is our responsibility, and as one VFP member stated, our sworn duty to uphold the Constitution and impeach this criminal president. As citizens, every one of us is complicit in his crimes. By virtue of that complicity, we are compelled not only by the law, but by morality and history to do whatever we can to stop this war of aggression and these crimes against humanity. 
the Nuremberg tribunals following World War II did not favorably judge the First Nation the world determined had waged a war of aggression, nor its good citizens who obeyed their government. And I heard that and I thought, wow, who are these guys? And I, I, they were veterans for peace. And I looked them up called and as you uh, mentioned earlier I'm not a uh, war veteran so I didn't know if I could join or not and they said yes it was open to all veterans regardless of when and where they were in service so that's what got me to join Richie and this was a national rally uh, after the Downing Street memo was uh, 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 let go in uh, May of 2005, and it got more coverage in the UK than it did here. Maybe uh, your audience is not familiar with the Downing Street memo, or some of them. I don't know. Oh, Should there's, I? There's, yeah, the, you do Phil. I, I'm sure that. Well, this audience, I'm sure, certainly will be. Yes. Yes. Well, for those who might not know, it was uh, it was revealed uh, that uh, Tony Blair's uh, Prime Minister Blair's. Uh, top uh, cabinet uh, met with uh, their counterparts with uh, President George Bush's cabinet in, in 2002. I think it was summer 2002 where they were trying to find a reason to wage war on Iraq and they settled on this, uh, this uh, uh, threat of weapons of mass destruction and how if uh, the, the, the UK and the US didn't go and attack Iraq first, uh, you know, they would get attacked, our, our nations would be attacked by them or could be. And uh, it, they knew it was a lie. So they said they were going to uh, uh, manufacture the evidence around the the uh, the lie, you know, basically, and th this was revealed in a leaked memo in the UK, and then it hit the newspapers here in the US on uh, May first, two thousand five, and then it was gone, you know. But it didn't slip past the anti-war people, and and to me that I thought, wow, you know, it's a flat-out lie. We've got uh, we've got smoking gun evidence here this should be it this should uh, be enough to stop the uh, the war in iraq and and it wasn't well it wasn't because the media in your country and in this country acted as cheerleaders now i know that's a, a cliche yes. and it's been used a million times but it's a fact in fact tragically several years ago the guardian and some other newspapers actually openly apologized for for their conduct in the lead up to the iraq war Incredible that we would talk about that today when these same newspapers are not asking questions about the Sergei Skripal poisoning. But that's another story. That's right, yes. the smoking gun memo, yeah, written by a guy called Matthew Roycroft, of course, um, back in 2002. So you expected, of course, Phil, like everybody else, well, the media will tear the president uh, a new one and we, well, won't, we won't be going to war and that will be the end of it. Well, uh, I kind of had a, a feel for the media... Uh, not, you know, being uh, uh, complicit um, based on the, the, the outrageous buildup to the war on Iraq and, uh, and, and how they were uh, treating anyone who questioned it, even the, uh, the, the chief United Nations weapon inspector, Scott Ritter, who was uh, an officer in the first Gulf War, and then he was a chief inspector on the UN inspection team after that and he was all over the tv and here is a decorated uh, marine veteran and, and uh, uh here are these talking heads on tv or, or instead of not only were they not listening to them but they were calling them names and and, and it, it just blew my mind what the media had become and and uh i i do want to compare uh, what we've been through here with this generation's Vietnam and the Vietnam that took place in, uh, in the 1960s and early 70s. Uh, back then, the media wasn't as uh, consolidated as it is in ownership. And there was very important, there was a military draft, you know. And, and I, I, I say, uh, when we first came out to uh, protest this war, uh, my lady friend, uh, Kathy Bracewell, 
and a few of us went out there and, and she looked around and said, where is everybody? Because she had uh, protested the uh, Vietnam War when her brother, her only brother was in Vietnam and it was a much bigger opposition to the same kind of policy and the same kind of killing. Do, do um, rem- we can remind our listeners that this was, this was a, a Pentagon policy. Phil is pointing out a, a really important area of recent history. The US media was, was, was very much um, d- a different thing than it is now and it reported very critically on the Vietnam War and it brought the reality of the Vietnam War into people's living rooms, into their dining rooms when they were having dinner. And the Pentagon decided, didn't it, Phil, after the Vietnam War, that it would never allow such a thing happen again. And one, yes. of, the, one of the things it adopted, of course, was this idea of embedding journalists with various platoons and various squadrons. So it would basically take the media into uh, its um, bosom, basically. It would go into Iraq, it would, it, would, it would go into these wars of aggression, and it would have journalists basically under control. It would be able to monitor what it, what it was the journalists saw, what they didn't see, more importantly, and um, it would basically get to write their stories for them. That's what we've yes. seen happen, yeah. Yeah. Yes, and and so they learned from Vietnam, you know, buy up the media, control the messaging, and whatever you can do, do not have a, a, a forced military draft. And, uh, you know, they didn't need it anyway. They had the economic draft, meaning there's uh, colleges, uh, you know, cost more than the price of a, a, a home. And uh, you people are, these young people are getting into debt and there's no jobs. So, uh, and here's another thing. Uh, there's that quote, uh, you sp- the, the pre- previous guest spoke of Nuremberg uh, a little bit. Uh, after Nuremberg, uh, there was the quote from, uh, uh, what was this, Hermann Goering, you know, Reich Marshal Hermann Goering, who said, uh, it's easy to take a country to war. All you have to do is uh, tell them they're, uh, they're being attacked and criticize any any of the peacemakers uh, objecting as being unpatriotic and putting the country to risk and and that's what they did here that media they called anyone who wore a uniform a hero and that's all we kept hearing and i'm sure there were plenty of men and women who who did heroic things and and faced great danger in battle but the point here is they shouldn't have been there in the first place and uh so any questioning of the war here had the same effect you know uh, we were looked at as as unpatriotic uh putting our troops at rest at risk and being traitors and uh uh, but you know what, Richie, the the thing I wanted to share, if possible, but, you know, in our time together today was I believe that we should never have gotten to the point of launching a war. We had uh, we had these guys with the 9-11 lie, which had so many holes in it. Well, I really want to talk about that, Phil, because one of yeah. the things one of the things that's coming up a lot in the last 18 months or so. It's not new, but I think people are becoming more aware of it. Identity politics, and you—you you talk. And we're going to talk now about your astonishment that among people like yourself who want to stop wars of aggression, who want to lock up criminal politicians, lawyers, warmongers, that when presented with evidence that, and I—I've done so many programs, sometimes with guests, sometimes on my own talking about the laughable 9-11 Commission report, which I've read. I read every single word of it. It took me ages, first time around, then I read it again. I know it intimately. It is laughable. It has been denied by uh, by, by, by Hamilton and Keane, the authors of it. It's been disowned by them uh, since mm-hmm. then. So you're talking to people when, when, when you first get involved in the peace movement and you're talking to them about, well, look, obviously we're heading off to Iraq and we're being told it's all about Saddam, weapons of mass destruction, and also the big lie that Saddam harboured al-Qaeda terrorists, which is another ridiculous lie. I mean, so ridiculous, again, because of religious differences. We won't even go into that. But you weren't being listened to. And not only were people not interested in hearing about it, Phil, they got angry and it caused divisions. Do you want to talk about that? 
Yes, I do. And I do need to clarify, I got involved with the anti-war uh, movement and, and helped found the Central Florida chapter in the summer of 2005. And I had not yet woken up to the 9-11 lie. I hadn't been exposed to any of the documentaries. And, and you know, 2005, the uh, uh, we are not, what is it, um, Loose Change had just come out and, and it had gotten bazillions of views and it was a uh, uh, very popular and it was informing a lot of people through the alternative media the internet and so so i was more on board with the veterans for peace uh, saying wow these guys are really uh, on the mark you know and, and you know and they did a lot of work to uh to make a case for impeachment for this war of aggression and then in uh uh, the fall of 2005, somebody gave me one of those DVDs uh, uh, in plain sight, uh, and I watched that, and my jaw hit the ground, and I thought, we've got to get this message out, and I really did think, Richie, uh, I was naive. I thought if I showed other people this video that they would have the same reaction as me, which was get mad you know and not instead they got mad at me <laughs> they got <laughs> mad at time. you this yeah. is this is we, we must mention Corey rove and dylan avery made loose change and yes. i had the pleasure of speaking with dylan twice the first time it was very interesting the second time it was a car crash interview because god love him he was so depressed because i think those guys thought when they put loose change on the market because it's an excellent film I mean, some of the conclusions it draws, you know, in terms of the missile underneath the plane and all that, I don't know if those were conclusive, but they did a brilliant job of dismantling most of the official story. So it's an excellent film. And I, and I think those guys thought, like you, Phil, because when I first saw it in 2005, 2006, about the same time as you, I thought, right, well, I'm going to show this to as many people as I can. I did in Spain show it to as many people as I could. And I largely got the same reaction. Ah, it's a load of nonsense, that, Richie. I'm like, what's a load of nonsense about it? So people got angry, Phil. How did that anger manifest itself? Are we talking, like, passive-aggressive behaviour? People just stop answering the phone, whispers behind your back. How does it manifest? Well, uh, I think on a one-to-one -one basis, a lot of it was, oh, you're one of those conspiracy yeah. nuts you know don't you know that what a, and then there was the dishonoring those who were killed and i think there could be no greater uh, betrayal or dishonor to those killed on 911 and uh, in thereafter in the name of 911 than denying the pursuit of truth you know as to what happened and uh, but a lot of people I think there's a lot of fear of, uh, you know, if I if I start talking about this, what are people going to think of me? You know, and there's that uh, fear of being separated from the herd. And uh, it, most people, Richie, I came to find are followers. And that's what I wanted to – that's what I came to uh, suspect about the leadership of the anti-war movement after a while. You know, it doesn't take – but a few people to lead millions, you know, and, and you've talked about this in the past, how just before the invasion of Iraq in 2002 and early 2003, there were tens of millions of people on the streets in the U.S., in the U.K., and in yeah. Europe uh, saying, no, do not launch this attack on Iraq. Now, we had critical mass there. And if those same leaders said, you know, there's uh, as Bob Bowman, Colonel Bob Bowman, uh, our, our friend here, the late Colonel Bob Bowman, who was a fighter pilot, was a, an interceptor pilot, and he also um, was uh, multiple uh, degrees in advanced degrees in different uh, uh, aspects of engineering. This guy was an expert. And as Bob Bowman used to say, there's no way in heck that four known-to-be hijacked jumbo jet airliners fly around the Northeast Corridor of the United States for 90 minutes without being intercepted. And there's no way in heck that uh, uh, fires 
fueled by kerosene-based jet fuel and office furnishings could make two 110-story uh, steel frame concrete buildings blow up into dust and fall in perfect symmetry in nearly free fall speed. And you see, that's that's all you need to know, Richie. But, but the way uh, we're manipulated is the people who don't want our message to get out, that kind of questioning to get out, they try to make us uh, say what did happen. Right, can I can yeah. I can I jump in there because this is really yes. important. So yes. do those people invariably end up at the top of organizations like Veterans for Peace and organizations like Stop the War Coalition here in London? I'll tell you why. Because I like some of the people attached to Stop the War Coalition. I've spoken to them over the years and I think they're pretty decent. They won't tolerate any talk about, you know, MI5 and Mossad arming ISIS. They don't want to hear any of that and they don't want to hear any talk about conspiracy theories about 9-11. And I'll tell you why I think this is. Now feel free, Phil, to absolutely wipe out my argument if I'm wrong. But I think that the people who get to the top of these organisations, they are leftists, with serious political ambitions of their own. That's what I believe. And they find a way... I mean, you talked about the, the rank-and-file members of Veterans for Peace, and I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit, who want to do impeach Obama. And yet the, the leadership managed to veto that because these organisations are, are either consciously or subconsciously infiltrated by people that are system people and have political ambitions. Am I wrong? Well, uh, I am wrong. <laughs> I would think, well, I, it's hard to give a blanket statement like that yeah. because uh, so many people, uh, you know, came to these organizations uh, because they thought what was going on was wrong and they wanted to do something about it to stop it. And but I think, uh, uh, and sure, uh, we'd be very naive to think that there weren't uh, people in place whose job it was to uh, – uh, keep the gate, so to speak, as far as uh, 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 posing any real threat to the status quo. Yeah. I mean, if you go back to the 1960s, uh, you know, the FBI here in, in, in the States, they had all kinds of infiltration of the anti-war uh, uh, movement and the Black Panther Party and all that. Uh, any any threat to, uh, uh, you know, the status quo, the, the power elite there, uh, is a threat that they want to neutralize. But I think more uh, at play here was was how deep this uh, identity with one side or the other and, and the, uh, dividing a country into two political parties is brilliant. You know, you want to neutralize a, a, a big group of people. Uh, there you go, divide them in half. And, and uh, I, people are they grow up and it this identity of the a lot of times with the one political party or the or the other the left or the right we're so conditioned to look at the other side yeah. as the problem and i saw that in the anti-war movement you know uh when it came to having a real opportunity to stop the war it it they chose uh, uh fighting the the other side instead and I could give you a, a, a very troubling example of that. Well just before you do obviously we won't mention yeah. any names of anybody who's yes. not here to defend themselves but just before we do because at the time it must be what Phil is getting at while the while George W. Bush was, was president at the time and his vice president was Dick Cheney and Rumsfeld of course defence secretary at the time and I think the Republicans had the Senate, they would have had the Senate, of course, they had Congress as well. The fact is, Phil, you're making a point here, correct me if I'm wrong, that they, there wasn't an awful lot of opposition to the war in the Democrat Party at all. But yet many of these um, protesters, many of these um, Veterans for Peace members would focus their wrath or their ire on Republicans, but wouldn't have anything to say about those Democrats who are going along with the rush to war. That's true as well, right? Uh, to some degree, Richie. Here in the States, uh, there was uh, 
and it was very partisan, you know, and, and the, uh, the 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 left and the anti-war people uh, uh, made a, a tremendous case for uh, the war being illegal and impeaching the president. But the thing is, uh, rather than look at it as the office of the president, we look at it as a person and the leader of the other team, you know. So we really had an opportunity to actually stop the war when the Democrat Obama came in in 2009. He was elected in 2008. And that's when our chapter initiated the uh, impeachment resolution. And uh, it was uh, an article, the third day in office, Obama sends drones into Pakistan, kills a bunch of people. And one of our group members, Tom Santoni, uh, wrote an article, impeach Obama, you know, and saying, look, you know, this guy just did what for four, five years we've been calling for impeachment for Bush. Yeah, over, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. and 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 uh, that's what led to the resolution, and and uh, uh, we finally got it passed uh, uh, at the 2011 convention, and then the that same guy who I quoted earlier, you know, our responsibility, our duty, is, yeah, uh, yeah, to yeah. impeach the, you know, the the one that got me to join Veterans for Peace. Well, at that time, he intervened, and uh, and 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 uh, would not allow a letter. The, the official letter uh, to be sent to members of Congress like the one for uh, Bush was. And we had to fight to get a, 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 the, the president to send a letter. We had to uh, create an, a resolution for that, and that was hijacked. So it never happened. The, the point I was making, going back to 2002. Yes. As far as I remember, maybe two dozen senators and maybe 150 congressmen and women, Democrats, voted for um, military action in Iraq. That's a yes. lot of people. And Yes, it is. Uh, and that was prior to invading Iraq. That was prior, but after yeah. invading, when, the, when it was clear that there were no weapons of mass destruction and we had kids coming home in body bags, it, it was a, a, a lot easier for the Democrats to to come out against the war. And it's very, the very, easy, very, very easy with hindsight. But at the time, yes. they knew about the um, Downing Street memo at the time that they went to vote for uh, military action. And, and this is the point we're making about identity politics and this lefty mindset in the peace movement. While yeah. they were right to be demanding that the, you know, that that obviously that the the, the bush led uh, administration doesn't take military action in iraq and you, you, you know they had to be also or they should have also been focusing their uh, concentration on those democrats who were just going along with it who didn't ask any questions who basically acquiesced and went along with the bush government but they didn't well yes but we've got to remember that the the leak the the Finding out about the Downing Street mem memo uh, wasn't released until the uh, May of 2005, yeah, two years, years into later. the, yeah, you know, yeah. and and then uh, uh, there were uh, there was Cynthia McKinney, I believe, introduced a impeachment resolution, uh, you know, for the. Um, uh, in Congress, there, there were there, there was a good move for impeachment, but it was partisan. It was viewed as partisan. Yeah, you know, and and that's the thing. So what I'm getting at is the the opportunity to actually, if you were putting stopping the war before political loyalties and ideologies uh, to those loyal, you know, it would have been when the Democrat was in, because then there's nowhere to pass the political football. The case had already been made. Books were written. It was, you know, there, there was plenty of reason to impeach Obama for doing the same thing as Bush did. And instead, the anti-war movement, uh, uh, the, the leadership made sure that it didn't didn't happen. And if you asked any of the leaders 
you know, one to one or on a radio show, do you think uh, Obama should be impeached for what he's doing? They, they would all say yes. You know, sure. He, but but when they got in front of a microphone or their emails to their rank and file, they were not leading the charge like they were when it was the Republican. And and so, what was uh, relevant back in two thousand two, Richie, before the wars were starting? was the 9-11 lie. There had already been a, a ridiculous amount of uh, uh, anomalies uh, uh, revealed, you know, to show that the whole, the sole one and only reason given for the wars was was bogus, you know. And, and we had, uh, I mentioned Colonel Bob Bowman earlier. He, he was a, a hero uh, to the anti-war movement. You see, back in the 70s, he was the director of... Uh, the Pentagon's uh, uh, Star Wars program, you know, and then he retired and he was uh, a couple years out of retirement and the the Reagan administration was in and some of the same characters, uh, Rumsfeld and Cheney were back then and they wanted to take the program and use it as an offensive first strike weapon and uh, the the chairmans of the chiefs, chief, uh, you know, the joint uh, the head generals there at the Pentagon, they called Bob Bowman back and asked him to blow the whistle on it because he was the director. He'd have the credibility. And here's here's the difference between Bob Bowman and other whistleblowers. And I don't mean to take away from their courage or what what they're sacrificing. But Bob Bowman had seven kids who wanted to probably wanted to go to college. And he was just starting a private career where he could make a little money. And he answered the call and, and he paid the price for it. And uh, so here they had this guy so credible that it was a hero to the anti-war movement, four-time keynote speaker at the Veterans for Peace conventions. And Bob Bowman, they could have put him right up front. And like I say, as a former interceptor pilot, what he said there, and as an engineer, what he said about the buildings coming down, you could have put him right up front and let him take all the arrows and all you had to do was stand behind him. So uh, we that's where I believe the anti-war movement uh, failed. And as the years went on and you had the films like Loose Change and all this information coming through, there was more of an effort to uh, by the leadership of the different anti-war organizations to to say no, we're not going to talk about 9/11 here because uh, that's going to hurt our credibility, and, and the people bought it. You know, is it still uh, the case, Phil? Uh, by yes. the way, you, you're right to correct me about the memo. Of course, the Democrats wouldn't have known about the Downing Street memo. We could argue about Hans Blix. I know Blix. It was very early 2003. When Blix was saying, I can't find anything there, we could argue about that, but you're right to make the point that, that I have to be honest on the programme, the Democrats couldn't have known about the memo in 2002. But we're on a very important point here about Bob Bowman and how Bob Bowman could have been used and um, put out front, as you said, his credibility was unimpeachable. Do you think it's still the case today, Phil, that in in these anti-war movements, whether they be in the United States, whether they be here, that the likes of September the 11th, which is, it's laugh, it's not laughable, it's not funny at all, but the fact that we're still even talking about how do we persuade people to have a second look at it, because it is the most obvious um, fit-up job, the most obvious false flag, ridiculous story ever told, 9-11. But I'm guessing at any at any meeting of any, you know, well-to-do or well-staffed peace movement today, it's probably still taboo, is it, Phil, to talk about I it? would, I would think so. And, and you know, the, there's now a Republican administration in office, and all of a sudden they're kicking off the same thing, uh, you know, in, instead of uh, pointing out the, the lie used to justify the wars they 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 say that oh that's the fascist right the empire you know and that's that's the target of concern you know so now we got a republican in and all of a sudden the anti-war movement is uh uh you know back up and running and and saying the same things and pointing in the same direction and uh it's it's sad, and the other thing is, Richie. It's been so many years, and the, the, because of uh, the consolidated ownership of the media, um, the people here in the states 
they don't even know that there's a, a still war going on and that we don't have the kids coming home in the body bags, thank God. But, you know, they don't see it. You know, they don't see it on the television. Uh, the, 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 the neighborhoods are not seeing uh, the, the, the kids coming back in the body bags. Uh, there's no draft. Uh, people are so disconnected. And I think the, what we have to do with those of us who, who give a damn is to try to find a way to connect um, what's happening in our name. You know, uh, we're using drones now and, and Tomahawk missiles, but they're still killing millions of people. But uh, we've got to find a way to make that connection uh, to let folks still uh, to know that there's still warfare going on in the name of 9-11. And that's why I try to ask people as much as possible to refer to the global war on terror as the 9-11 wars to, to, to make that connection, that it's 9-11 that's still justifying all of this. Let me remind our listeners, Phil, um, we're, we're, we're joined this evening. Um, it's in the afternoon there, of course, in central Florida. Um, about time too, by a uh, peacetime veteran of the U.S. Army, Phil Restino, who founded the Central Florida chapter of Veterans for Peace. Phil's a journalist and a good journalist as well. Uh, Phil will tell us in a minute where you can um, read and find out more about him. 9-11 is massive, Phil. It's massive. And I, I think it's it's so worthwhile to keep making time for it on programmes like this, you know, as we go on. Frustrating sometimes as it is to be talking about it and rehashing the same things. I think it's vitally important. The identity politics thing, though, is, you know, I'm uh, a Democrat or I'm mm. a, a liberal is very important because even before 9-11, you made a very good point there a minute ago. You made an excellent point, actually, about the anti-war movement is back up and running again now that Donald Trump is in the White House. But, Phil, you can go back to pre-W Bush, you can go back to Clinton and Kosovo mm -hmm. and presumably the anti-war, anti-interventionist movement wasn't doing very much when, you know, Clinton and Blair um, were basically, you, you know, responsible for a genocide in Kosovo. Yes. Yes, it, it's so true. It uh, And you go back to the president prior to that, uh, Bush and uh, uh, Bush Sr. and Ronald Reagan, you know, uh, their war activities, they were all kind of, that's how Veterans for Peace started in 1985 was uh, uh, the veterans were concerned about the U.S. Uh, uh, in Central America, you know, yeah. and, and yes, the, this identity of being a Democrat or a Republican, it, it's uh, God, we've got to step away from that. And, you know, people ask, you ask, uh, you know, what are you, you know, that instead of saying I'm, I'm a human, you know, uh, I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican. People go right to that. It, Phil, if, if, yeah. if, if, um, forget Hillary, right? Because Hillary is Hillary. And I like to think that even, even some rank and file card carrying Democrat liberals would be, would be appalled by the murderous, the lunatic that is Hillary Clinton. Let's imagine Trump didn't win and a Democrat called Jimmy Murphy won. So Jimmy Murphy is in, he's the president, not Trump. And imagine Jimmy Murphy has has authorised a no-fly zone over Syria and is bombing government positions in Syria. Are you telling me that a lot of the anti-war movement just wouldn't come out to protest that because he's a Democrat, because he's Jimmy Murphy and he's over there on the pretense of protecting civilians from a bastard dictator? What would the anti-war movement do? Well, the, the, we saw that when Obama came in, yeah. uh, uh, th that there were people that were against the war as long as it was a Republican uh, overseeing it um, but there were still people that were true truly against the wars and would would come out but it, it, we did lose a lot of people when uh, the, the administration switched from Republican to Democrat and, and uh, that was sad uh, are we doomed then Phil because you see if this is the way it's going to be you and I have had conversations on email you and I 
Yes. And um, your insights are very valuable. And I w- I'm not just saying that because you're here and your recommendations and stuff, very valuable to me. I'm glad to know you. You, you, you see, I think we, we've, I think we've arrived at the conclusion that two sides are the same kind. It doesn't matter. The house yes. always wins. How can you ever? I mean, my friend, uh, uh, who's also a huge help to me, Jean Ann Crowley, the actress in uh, Clegg and my great pal, she says to me, you know, ask Phil, why does he think that people are so utterly uninterested in 9 11? She finds that fascinating. But, but that's directly connected. Why are they uninterested in 9 11? Is directly connected to why do they keep buying the same crap? You know, why do they keep falling into one of two groups? I'm either on the left or I'm on the right. Why don't they learn? Well, I, I think it's it's conditioning. You know, the, the powers that be have have figured out how to, how to condition people. Look, you have television stations. You have the uh, Fox News, uh, which is similar to Sky News, I guess, over there, uh, uh, you know, where they take the, the side of the right, you know, and everything yeah. wrong is, is the Democrats' fault, you know. And, and the, the people tuning in are programmed with that. And the same thing here, we have a MSNBC and you've got the left and of course uh, everything is wrong everything wrong is the fault of uh, the Republicans and the people on the right uh, television I remember my pop when we were kids in the 1960s watching the black and white television set with only three channels he lined us up and he pointed at that box he said see that box that box is more powerful than an atom bomb and I believe he was right. Um, and plus, people are overwhelmed, Richie. You know, you you one paycheck away from from losing this your street, home. Street, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it, there's yeah. just uh, people. There are I believe there's a lot more people who who do care and would do more if they could, but uh, everybody is so overwhelmed. Can I just uh, say something there? I think again. Yeah. I think, again, you've hit on something extraordinary. Do you know, people, they go to the echo chamber. So if it's CNN or if it's Fox News, and we sometimes think it's because they're stupid or we call it, well, I don't use the term sheep, but some people do. They're sheep, they're stupid, um, whatever. And maybe you've just hit on something there that we don't consider at all. When people are stretched the way they are, when they are stressed, when they are miserable, when they are one paycheck away from the curb, which a lot of people are, as you just said, I think you've hit the nail on the head, my friend. I think, why wouldn't they switch over to Fox or to CNN because that channel is telling them what they want to hear? Because they're getting yes. some comfort. Oh, don't worry about it. If our guy gets in, everything will be okay. But why wouldn't they do that? I think that's a brilliant point, Phil. Yes, they're exhausted when they get home. You know, uh, the yeah. college students, uh, again, that was a big part of uh, 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 opposing the war in Vietnam here uh, was the, the colleges. You know, uh, the students, uh, they didn't, you know, the students today are saddled with so much debt. You know, and uh, the uh, the so few jobs that they really have to compete for. You know, they've got other things on their mind. They're not thinking about what what our uh, planes and drones are doing as far as killing millions of brown people. They they don't. There's a disconnect. You know, there's no military draft. So uh, we've got to find a different way of making the connection. And I believe uh, the 9/11, Richie. It's still the soul one and only reason given for the war and that's why you have to have to question these anti-war organizations why they didn't scream from the rooftops you know but it let alone uh, they 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 uh, uh, suppressed any questioning of 911 you know fear so of I ridicule phil mm-hmm. you, you you said fear of ridicule feel fear yes. of being isolated you know away from the herd, um, yes, and 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 that really is it. I, you know, I I tend to think you're right. I don't think, for most people, I don't think there's anything sinister about why they didn't want to talk about nine eleven. I really do believe it's the power of, it's the power of the popularity contest. It's the power of being in 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 amongst the herd and not to be out there on your own. Oh, look at that idiot there. He believes that. 
the government was complicit in the 9-11 attacks. I think you're absolutely... And I think it endures today, that fear. Uh, how do yes. we? How do we get... We've got about two and a half minutes left, Phil. Okay. How do we get around that? How can we use what happened on 9-11? Because each year that goes by, it's like the bloody Kennedy assassination. Yes. How, yes. What do we do about that, finally? I think we all can do something. There's that saying, nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. I keep a, a stack of flyers on my, the front seat of my car. My friend uh, Brett Bracewell, an activist here, wonderful activist, he keeps a bunch of DVDs on the front seat of his car. Uh, the ones I keep are the firefighters for 9-11 Truth flyers. And whenever I'm in a parking lot and I see a vehicle that has the firefighter emblem on it, I'll put one on the windshield. You know, uh, you can have a bumper sticker on your car if you if you're comfortable with that. Everybody can do something. You know, if you you called and there's a phone companies calling you for paying your bill or whatever, you know, and they ask you, is there anything else I can help you with? You know, say, did you ever hear of World Trade Center Building 7? You know, everybody could do something and we must. And uh, as they say, every little engagement like that or of outreach is another pencil hole in the dam. Well, you're right, because you never know who that one person might be. 100 people might ignore you. But the one yeah. person you might get through to might turn out to be the next chief justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. And I don't say that for a laugh. You never know who might say, well, I'm going to talk about this and I'm going to talk about it on TV. I think that's a, a good point. Phil, where can people find out more about you? I, I have links, but I don't know which ones I should give out. So well, you go ahead. Uh, we shut down our Veterans for Peace website uh, when we... Uh, disbanded the chapter and we started a uh, Facebook page of uh, We Are Change CFL that stands for Central Florida. It's the Bob Bowman Memorial chapter. But I, I wanted to mention uh, uh, I am the face of truth dot com and, and these folks are doing a wonderful job using Facebook and social media to, to get uh, the 9-11 information out. Uh, so just get on the web. Uh, AE911truth.org is another. Uh, just keep sharing the information. Every little bit helps. Really great to catch up with you, Phil, on the program. It's been um, it's been a long time coming, but I'm glad you did it. And I'll be asking you back again oh, in, the, so. in, the, in, in the next few weeks. No, I will uh, to talk more about uh, these issues. I, I'm, I'm I'm delighted. Thanks for doing it, and uh, thanks for being interested in not just this show but other shows. Um, without you know people like you and your encouragement, there wouldn't be um, programs like this. So I really mean that, Phil. I wouldn't say it otherwise. Thanks for that well, today, my friend. I'll give you the final word, and um, I better wrap up then before we get too close to the top of the hour. Sure. Thank you, Richie. This has been a real uh, thrill for me uh, to be on your program. I think it's a wonderful program, and and it's catching on more and more. I know it's big out in Europe, but it's catching on more and more here in the states. And and uh, I want to thank you once again for the opportunity to to share what we did today. It was an honour, Phil. I'm glad to have met you, and I look forward to doing it again. Look after yourself, uh, mate, and thanks for coming on today. I really appreciate that. That was Phil Restino, a uh, top man, speaking to us live from Central Florida. We will get Phil on again in the near future, there's no doubt about that. 